Howdy, it's Tubal Kane again, and this is part two of my series on building a small model dynamo or generator. Now, uh, let's have just a little bit of uh, terminology here first. That Remember that uh, the portion here that I'm going to work on today is called the statter. Now, statter just means it's the stationary part. And the statter can be either an armature or a field and in this case it's going to be a field and the field can be a field winding or it can be permanent magnets and in my case it's going to be permanent magnets those of you that watched my video some time ago when I built a demagnetizer remember that I used the statter and field windings or field windings of uh, an electric split face motor to make that uh, demagnetizer so this video I'm going to make the statter. This of course is the rotor, rotor rotating, moving, and in this case it is the uh, armature also. And this is a commutator type, and a commutator, this is just a two-piece commutator, is nothing more than a moving or a rotating switch with brushes acting upon it, either delivering or picking up the current. And I hope I got that terminology correct. I am not an expert on electricity or motors. I am a machinist, foundryman, and model maker at best. Now the statter in this case it was um, maple wood, just hardwood, and uh, it really can be any material. And I would very much like to make it out of plastic, uh, uh, such as this PVC, but I only have a piece that's half inch thick. I, if I had a piece that was three quarters thick, I would go ahead and make it because it's so easy uh, to machine. But instead, I'm going to use this piece of three quarter inch aluminum, rolled aluminum. And uh, this was given to me by my buddy Dave down in St. Louis, my uh, uh, internet buddy. I've never met him, but we talk frequently on the phone, and thank you, Dave, for sending this to me last year, along with a bunch of other aluminum. I've already put some bluing on here, and I'm ready to lay it out, and as you well know, I seldom work from a drawing, but sometimes I make patterns or sketches, and in this case, this is just uh, the, the pattern that I made to visualize the shape and the size back when I made this. And I made these in several different sizes, and uh, now I'm going to go ahead and lay this out. That's just done on a piece of cardboard, like a donut box, and it just happens to fit right about here on this plate between the holes. And I may even run a little bit into this hole, but I'm not going to worry about it. Now the whole idea here is after I lay this out, I need to uh, start machining, and that can be done in several different sequences, and uh, you know whatever you prefer. But I intend to uh, uh, cut it out, saw it out, and then form the outside of the statter, and then I will put it back either in the mill or the lathe. I haven't decided yet, and bore this hole. In the wooden one, I used a uh, one and a half inch hole saw, but I just don't care for hole saws in heavier material. They will work, but these have to be run at a very, very slow speed, and I could do that on the milling machine, and I may still yet do it. I haven't decided. I'll see what, uh, I'll decide on that when I get that far, but I'm going to start the layout right now. If you do a layout, get yourself a granite surface plate. I love to work on it. Nice, flat, true surface, and you definitely need a height gauge. So useful. Now this is set at one and a half inches and I'm going to scribe the end too. You'll see why later. Also, it just so happens that I'm, I need it to be about one and a half inches from the end too. And I will take my punch now, I'm not going to show the entire layout, just some of the key points. And looking at my, this is my drawing. We need a three-quarter radius, that's inch and a half, uh, hole. And then one and one-eighth for the outside diameter, which is two and a quarter 
diameter, one and one eighth radius is what that is. So I got the little stir dividers here set for three quarters. Another stir divider set for one and one eighth. Love those Starrett tools. I extended the center line to go all the way across, which I should have done to start with. And now with the height gauge set for a quarter inch, I'm going to lay out the base. And I already changed my dimension from 5 sixteenths, which might be a little too thick, but that's just a matter of opinion and preference. That's the base, and with my divider set for a little less than one and a half, and you can measure this with a, uh, a ruler as well, but I'm just marking off the length of the base, and I may change that later. But the reason I'm making it a little bit wider at the base than the original is that there is no clearance here to drill these holes. And I had to drill them from the bottom. So both for drilling and installing the screws, it would be a little handier if I could uh, if I had a little greater length. So for now, I'm going to do it that way and if I change my mind later on, why why I will, I guess. That's what I'll do. So and that comes almost to the end there, as you can see. Boy, I came close to that hole. As if I didn't have it planned. What I'm attempting to do now is to locate a hole right about here that I can drill and it'll just be a, a clearance hole so that when I come around here and saw and then uh, possibly mill I'll have a, a termination point for that and I'm just going to drill that quarter inch but it may be uh, different than that but the height gauge is set for 7 16 so I'm laying out a line here and here already have actually and then with the dividers set for 11 sixteenths from the center line here. I'm just marking it as such. And now I will center punch those two holes that I just laid out. Oh, I guess I'll do it now. I was going to wait. I, I don't want to take too much time on this. An automatic center punch is mighty handy. I've had this one, it's a Fowler. I've had this one forever. 40 or 45 years. Okay, now those two holes, those two center punch marks, are ready to drill and I, like I said, quarter inch. Now next I'm going to lay out the hole here for the field magnets. It's so much easier to drill this when it is still a block after, rather than after it's round and I do not know the size of the magnets that I'm going to use because I ordered some over eBay and they're not here yet. So I'm just going to drill that eventually here about quarter inch and then I can go back in and re-drill that or ream it or whatever I need to do when the magnets arrive and I finally determine which ones that I'm going to use. Also you'll notice here I laid out another circle slightly smaller than the original one so I may use that inner circle here because I want again this entire dynamo to be fairly small in size physically. So that completes the layout for now other than possibly a line across here 
which will be a saw line to, to saw it off from the main block because naturally I have to shorten this up in order to uh, to drill that hole and that uh, by the way is three inch wide stock that Dave gave me so that's just my saw line there no nope, I take it back that's going to be out here farther right through that hole I was trying to avoid the hole but now I remembered my layout line here so forget that hope I don't saw it on the wrong line and have to start over quite discouraging to have to start over as you well know as you know I'm a big fan of uh, drilling a little pilot hole just to get it started I normally use my Cameron drill press which is of course my favorite but I also have uh, a little do more and uh, this might be my YouTube uh, uh, debut for this machine so uh, say hello to do more here and another point here is I dug the, the do more out I absolutely love to use lead solder to wind up excess cords or uh, when I put things away such as a soldering iron or a soldering gun you know it's a nightmare what do you do with all that extra cord? So wrap some solder around it. It's supple and it's soft, but yet it'll hold and it's easy to take off and on. So I don't know who told me that, but I, I do love that. But this little uh, do more. Uh, we raise and lower the table rather than a raise and lower the head. That's a 16th inch bit, which I dedicate. And I'm just going to mark these two holes here. Just, I just go in little ways and then the hole is located. You know, the Dumore Company of Racine, Wisconsin made a lot of drill heads like this that were used on other types of automation machines. So, you know, they made a fine and durable product. I don't know if they still make these little drill presses, but it's kind of neat, isn't it? And it's cast iron. Enough of that. A little sidebar here. Some of you like my sidebar, some do not. Now I remember where I got the idea of the solder. I bought something at an auction a long time ago and somebody had it wrapped up with solder and I promptly took it off when I got home and I thought what kind of hillbilly type of deal is this? And then eventually it dawned on me like, well this is a, a stroke of genius. So I went back to using it plus I have at least 50 rolls of solder so there's no shortage of it. And now uh, just another little sidebar about my Swedish humor which is uh, appreciated by many out there but probably not everybody but uh, when I was teaching at school uh, I was able to crack up some kids not everybody understood the dry humor but I did know that when I went into the teachers lounge at noon that I was able to crack people up and uh, so I, I hope that when these funnies come uh, to my mind and I blurt them out that you know you get some enjoyment out of it. Now back to the subject at hand here on the original one here that I made I talked about this the other day that I had this little boss here and I do like the appearance of that although I'd like it to be round but I decided not to do that here because it's just uh, rather difficult to do especially if I do this on a rotary table but my solution to that will be if I need extra length here for magnets, I will have a little sleeve, a little tube that is a, a magnet uh, holder. Kind of like you see a brush holder made in uh, some small electric motor. So that's a possibility. So that's why I am not doing it uh, by this method here. This is, by the way, a Reynolds aluminum. And it was a component uh, of something that Dave took apart. But there's still a lot of good aluminum in there. So I drilled those two quarter inch holes and sawed this to length. And I must confess that WD-40 does work pretty well on my metal cutting bandsaw, which I have sped way up 
but it's not uh, it's a half inch wide blade so I'm going to really struggle going around the corner here and it's uh, it's not a skip tooth it's just a 18 tooth uh, blade so it's it's not ideal for aluminum at all and the finish of course is horrible but I don't care now the next thing off camera I'm going to uh, real quickly square this up on the Bridgeport milling machine so that it can be held to drill this hole, uh, held uh, squarely. Otherwise, if I would drill that hole now, it, no telling where it's liable to go. And off camera, I also will, uh, this is three quarters thick, I'll set my uh, height gauge for three eighths and, and uh, I draw a center line there and center punch it. And I am presently drilling the uh, cross hole for the brushes. I won't show all of that. And I will probably need to use an extra long drill bit for that, of which I have tons of. Them. I'm at the bandsaw now, and I'm not going to show all of this, but uh, I've drilled this cross hole now. And I'm ready to start sawing. And it's a rather tight radius here, so it's, it's going to be choppy, as I mentioned before. But be sure and wear your safety glasses and use a pushing stick on the bandsaw. Why is that loud? That's what it looks like after it's been rough sawn. Now, for those of you at home, if anyone ever makes this, you could use the belt sander. But the problem is you can't get in here with the belt sander. Now, you might be able to do uh, with a little one inch wide that has a narrow platen, but this would work. But I'm going to approach it a different way. Notice I've lost most of my uh, layout lines, and I think I'll retouch that up, put a little bluing on it, and uh, I still got my center hole there. But I'd like to be able to see these circles. So I'll do that off camera. Boy, I drilled that hole fast, didn't I? Okay, the first thing you have to do when using a rotary table, and I've shown this in other videos, so I won't spend much time on it, but the, the table has to be centered with the center of the milling machine spindle. And the way I do it, it can be indicated, but this is a good enough method for a lot of what you might do. Is I made this plunger here some time ago, and notice I've got it lined up so it comes right into the center of this is my palm grin table. Notice that the table is not bolted down yet. I still have this wiggle room, so I, so I wiggled it into place, and now I'm ready to tighten the two uh, hold downs evenly as such. It's my one and sixteenth inch, one and one sixteenth inch wrench, and then I can back this out. And the table is ready, and I just turned on my digital readout. And I am zeroing it out in case I ever want to come back to that point. I actually probably spent an hour working on this setup, but I'm through the magic of television, it happens pretty fast. That I had to make this little T bolt here that would fit in the center here because I intend to clamp this down right on the center, as I showed you a minute ago. Also, there needs to be a piece, piece of a waste stock so that I don't mill into the table itself. So this is just a piece of aluminum. And this is a 3 8 end mill in the collet, upside down. And again, I'm aligning the work. And I got to get that into the, yeah, there I'm into the waste stock. Like that. Set that off to the side. And then I have a, a clamp right here that'll go like this. And, you know, it just takes a lot of time to find clamps that are the right size and bolts that are, are the right size. And 
And uh, I wanted this clamped, doubly clamped, so it doesn't come loose. So that's my outside clamp, and I'm straddling this slot. And I will tighten that down. Then I will raise the spindle, and that will expose that hole so I can tighten it down in the center with this hardened bolt. And I wish I would have used a fine thread, but I didn't have any. As you well know, sometimes the setup takes longer than the actual machining, so I take in the end mill, and notice it's an extra long fluted end mill, because I needed at least three quarters of uh, flute. And a standard one was three quarters, but uh, not quite enough. And I'll put that now into the collet, tighten it up, and I will bolt this down, and hopefully this will secure it, and it will not move on me. But I don't believe that uh, just this bolt in the center would do that. And I had to space this just so with the, with the right washers so that the bolt didn't bottom out into that T-slot. I'm not really sure yet, but I'm sure this, or probably sure that uh, this bolt is going to be too long and hit the spindle here, and if so, I'll have to change that. But uh, with the DRO set on zero, should I have to return to that spot, I can now bring the, uh, and you know, I'm just going to go down halfway and take a trial cut, lock the spindle, and go clear around it and, and just kind of get the feel for it on whether I have to climb mill or conventional mill. And I suspect that I will be conventional milling because there's always play. Can you see that play? And climb milling will sometimes take up that uh, lost motion and can break the cutter or leave a mark or whatever. Probably won't break the cutter with aluminum uh, on a light cut, but it uh, ruins the finish. Just as I predicted, this stud was too long, so I replaced it with a cap screw, and that's done. And I took a trial cut. Now when I get back here into the corner, as I get closer to my dimension, to almost return... Uh, Rather than using a stop to this, at the same uh, spot each time, I can go by degrees here on the zero mark on both ends. Now I'm only down halfway. And also, as I predicted, I'm getting a horrible cut uh, with uh, climb milling. But I think uh, my finish cut, possibly, where I'm only going to take off about a thousandth, will uh, improve the finish. And this is rather tedious. I'm not going to show all of it because there's an hour's worth of milling here. It's rather hard cranking. Yeah, I will later. I'm trying to keep it clean enough so you can see what I'm doing. Again, now I'm down into that corner and I can take a reading here if I wanted to. Now I'm going to go back the other way, so I'm going to feed my table in in the x axis a little bit. As I'm going out, I'm climb milling. And you might see the table jump a little bit, but since it's a light cut, the finish isn't too bad at the moment. You see it uh, jerking? That's the, la the lost motion being pulled out. So when I go in the other direction, this is uh, conventional milling. The finish isn't very good either, but it'll be better when I get lubrication on it. But it's going to be fine. As you can see, I'm progressing here. 
each time I'm going a little deeper and moving the x-axis till I'm down to my layout line and pretty soon I'll be into the waist stock. Now when I come into this uh, acute corner here I have written down the the number of degrees and when I get into this one it was uh, 145 degrees so that I, I stop at the same place each time. And I'm using a little of that. As you can see, it's pretty tedious. It'd be nice to have a power feed. I'm on my second to the last pass. I'm down into the waste stock now. And I'll take one more pass after this, climb milling with uh, increasing the feed by mm, three thousandths. This is the final pass climb milling. Three thousandths is all I'm taking off. And you can see a dwell mark there where I stop and talk to the camera. Right there. The periphery is finished. What I need to do now is to mill the uh, base in the y-axis here, like this. So I had to uh, try to align uh, the bottom of the stator perpendicular to the machine, or perpendicular to the to the work table, which I'm, I'm mainly doing by eyeball, but I also touched it off just with the end mill on, on each side and got it toward where I think it's pretty close and I'm going to take it down to approximately a quarter inch here and it's really going to be hard to try to blend that into that corner in there so that uh, I don't have multiple tool marks but I guess that's not very important. Well, that's it on that. Take it over to the bench, deburr it, and take a look at it. Well, there it is. Looks pretty good. Matter of fact, it looks very good if I dare say so myself. Got a couple holes to drill here for mounting it and later re-drill these magnet holes. But uh, the main problem here is I need to bore this out now. How in the world am I going to hold that? I could put it back on the milling machine and clamp it and bore it, but you know there's just not much left here to, to clamp it to. I wonder if I can do it on a lathe. I wonder if I can bore it, but how would I ever hold it? Well, I'll be doggone. It fits right into the three-jaw chuck of my Atlas lathe. What a coincidence. I think I'll bore it out on the Atlas Craftsman. Good idea. Now I will also need a packing on the back of here so I do not damage the chuck. So I'll have some waste stock back here. Possibly some protection here so I don't put uh, chuck marks on here, although it doesn't really matter too much. 
You know what? That took probably 90 minutes to do that milling. I'm worn out. I'm quitting for the day and going to have a little supper. Thanks for watching. I'll see you tomorrow.